So we'll go ahead and start off with Digital Strategy Masterclass. Um, I work for an agency, but also do a lot of consulting on the side. My background is on the brand side, it's on the publisher side, it's on the agency side, and it's on the consulting side. I've been able to experience a lot of different versions. So I've seen things not, not even just six months ago working for a brand and made a change, but I, I've been able to sort of take a perspective uh, from a lot of different people to, to help me form you know, a lot of my own opinions and see what's going on in the market. A lot of what I do though personally is like coming to conferences where you have a wonderful opportunity to network with people. I also do a podcast, which I mentioned yesterday, and that podcast has also helped me engage with a lot of the top thought leaders in the country. And honestly, uh, I consider pretty much everybody a thought leader. I've learned a, a phrase that a friend of mine who uh, is the head of marketing at, at S, uh, S Simrush, um, she, she said, and I think it's always indicative and helpful for conferences like this, to consider yourself not a subject matter expert, but a subject matter learner. I think it's always important because these kind of conferences give you an amazing opportunity to learn different opinions from different people. So what are some of the challenges that we all go through today as digital marketers? And the, I'll show you first a study that came out. This was in eMarketer. This was a recent survey that talked about the, the things that we're all battling with, with in marketing. One of the biggest things that's part of my focus in my role at my company also is talking about cross-channel measurement and attribution, but this is a survey, and I would, I would assume that you probably have a similar look in whatever you do, uh, maybe flip the, the funnel, but it, you know, these are mostly the t same types of challenges that we all go through. One of the biggest problems, and I, I thought about this the last time I was in New York when I was, uh, spoke at Digimark on East, is when you walk down, and this is indicative for all brands, okay, but the noise that we're having to compete against, to me, kind of felt like where I usually stay when I'm up there, which is somewhere around Times Square. You know, the, the industry averages that we're hit with 5,000 messages a day in marketing and advertising. And I think that's pretty true for all brands. And it's become, you know, you really can go about two blocks and get 5,000 messages when you walk through Times Square. But... It's also a giant problem for us to be relevant and get our brands out there, especially if you're a solopreneur or somebody working with a limited budget who's you know, doing something wonderful with a, with a group to help kids get coats. I mean, there's a lot of noise that you have to overcome. So for me, a lot of what I talk about because of the brands that I've worked with is what I'm often focused on is sales and leads, which is one of the big transitions for marketing, especially. There are a lot of great things that people are doing that I've spent time on as well with social engagements and things like that. But ultimately, we're trying to grow a business or move something ahead to help a business grow and achieve better results, which I'm hoping everybody's seen that movie, knows that reference. Uh, but oh. Brand differentiation, though, is something that is key and focused to me. And this is something that I'll talk about a lot today. One of the biggest things that I think of, and, it, and a perfect example of this is I just stayed at the Hilton Garden Inn because there's umpteen different conferences right now. And couldn't get a hotel here because I booked it too late, but I stayed at the Hilton Garden Inn. When you walked into, which was a lovely hotel, I don't want to get lawyers involved, but when you walk into the lobby, it said, I believe it said Hilton on the cover, uh, on, the, on the door above. But when you walk in, there's a desk here, and there's a Hilton Bay of Elevators to the side. Just to the right side of the front desk was a Home 2 Bay of Elevators. And then to the right of that was an entrance to go into another bay of elevators for Hampton Inn. Now, all these are Hilton properties, but it's something that, that shows that even Hilton is leveraging. I mean, it's the same kind of runny eggs that you get at every hotel. And I stay at a lot of hotels, and it's the same thing that troubles me with a lot of brands is they don't have a differentiator. For scale, it makes sense for them to have everything in there, but how do you differentiate out your brand? So one of the things that often comes up is why we buy. This is the psychology of, of why we buying that fascinates me. There are a lot of studies that have been done, and I fit the bottle in yellow. I'm the, the husband who will go overpay for something that I don't need because I think that Bayer has established, for example, a brand name. They've established their brand that makes me think that their brand is more valuable 
to, uh, to me simply because of their packaging and, and marketing and advertising around it. It's the exact same ingredient though in a generic bottle of aspirin today. So why do we pay more? Why does my wife understand to pay less for an item, yet I'll go spend a dollar or two more? A lot of that is, is the differentiator in why we buy. And that also applies to your digital marketing efforts. A couple of people that always like to recommend just good books and authors to read. Uh, Martin Lindstrom is the bottom two books. He's written biology. And he's a brilliant author that's written 15 or 16 books. It's something ridiculous. Mostly, most of them are bestsellers. And then also Gerald Zaltman, who talks about the purchase decisions people make that take place in the subconscious mind. So good books to help you understand why we're making this as you move forward with your marketing efforts, trying to establish a differentiator in your business. Now, I equate a lot of this to Bird Box. Um, kind of a weird analogy, but it was an interesting movie that was seen by 40 million people that first week it came out. But when I go back to the hotel analogy, it was perfect when I went in there, it made me think of this again. You go into the hotel, it almost feels like if you woke up and you had a blindfold on and you didn't know where you were, if there wasn't a pen or a pad in there that said Hilton Garden Inn or Hampton or Marriott or whatever, you know, XYZ Express, Red Roof Inn, Motel 6 name, so many of them look the same. Would you be able to call the police if they said, you know, what's the, where are you? I don't know because there's nothing that shows what, your, what the difference in the brand is. There's nothing about the experience. That, again, this is relevant to physical experience as opposed to digital. But if they were marketing that in the digital world, what's the differentiator? Most brands don't have that out there. I worked for a large lawn care brand. It was the largest in the country. You try competing against you know, tens of thousands of competitors who all apply stuff on lawns. It's not easy easy to do. But this is a reference that, that Anne Hanley, uh, the, the queen of content, wrote, and I love this. If you took, the, took off the logo off of a brand, would people know your brand? This applies so much in digital because if you're spending any money on, your, on marketing and advertising, you can get killed and blow your budget really quickly on non-branded terms. You want to go into generic terms for lawn care, for example, forget about it, or for hotel or anything else. Auto insurance is a huge one where you're paying a ridiculous amount for that, but if you have a differentiator on brand, it can make a big difference. To me, it is a, working in the paid media world, it is a huge qualifier for your brand versus non-brand strategy for paid media and advertising. Building out the fact that you are um, any type of, of brand, and maybe it's different for a state government in Indiana, maybe it's not the best example, but even a nonprofit uh, trying to brand itself has to have a differentiator so that they, they can so that you can accent what it is that makes your brand different. When you it also applies to your local uh, near me type strategy, which you know if we're if we're looking, I think Starbucks has probably perfected this as much as anybody else. But if you look at your near me strategy, which is a big component of your local listings, then brand makes a huge differentiator in how you can do those listings in your map pack. When you think of coffee near me, what do you typically think of? Which brand? Thank you, Starbucks. The power of brand though resonates heavily for these. These are each names that we think of that are synonyms, but they've, they've developed a brand. If you're getting, uh, you know, the Salesforce conference was here. If you're getting a CRM, a lot of people refer to it as Salesforce. You know, your Salesforce is Salesforce. You're not looking, searching for something on the internet, you're Googling it. I mean, poor people at Bing must be upset about that. Nobody buys tissue, you buy Kleenex. Um, nobody buys lip balm, they look for chapstick. These are, these are differentiators that people have created that give them, you know, people, other people are having to bid on your branded terms. So I always encourage a lot of brands, and I've, I've seen this a lot as well, to think smaller. Again, it's another local map pack listing, but you've got to, in digital marketing today, really optimize your local, your hyper-local strategy. Hyper-think your near-me strategy is something I talk about often. Really focus on what that differentiator is in, in that circle. So I'm going to talk about some of the different pieces of things we work on in, in marketing, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them. There were so many that we couldn't cover yesterday on the, on the Digital Trends panel. There are a lot that we're not going to be able to cover today, but I'm going to try to cover as many as possible. So is content still king? By the way, apologies for 
uh, the, some of the worst free Google imagery you're ever gonna see. I'm a professional, so don't try this at home, please. But is content still king? Right now, we're really suffering with a content shock problem. There's so much content that's being generated out there. You know, we were talking about the content pieces that we put out there and we craft, but another thing that's coming up that we mentioned yesterday, there's a huge amount of content that's now being generated by AI and machine learning that's not written. It's, it's not written by a human, it's written by a machine. And that's, you, you saw stories of that with the fake news, this type of stuff that comes out that can be generated hyper quick and flood the market. Well, how do you get yours to stand out? Seth Godin, the brilliant marketer, said content marketing is the only marketing left, which is, uh, I don't know if it's true, but it's, it's a really smart way of looking at talking about some of the differentiation you do when you write out what it is you're doing in your brand as well. Most people, though, don't have a content marketing strategy. And according to Content Marketing Institute, that only 39% of organizations had it, and 65%, the ones that did, were the top performers. So just... As an FYI, I always like to throw up a couple of tools in case people are looking for tools. This is a friend of mine at Cabinet M that puts this list out, the CEO. She's um, really smart. They put out a list every year of just different content tools. So if it's worth anything, you'll see the deck later. Uh, again, with technology stacks, when looking at content, 75% report using tech to gain insight, but only 56% use it to look at their audience preferences, which is still crazy. So I'm gonna talk about some of the different types of piece of content and how we can you know, optimize those to perform better. One are blogs. Over a billion six websites in the world, 500 million are recognized as blogs. You're talking about two million blog posts a day. That's an insane amount. And I don't care what vertical you're in, it may not be two, it may not be two million blog posts a day. It's generally gonna be a significant amount just for the, for the exponential number of, of ones that come out so frequently. So how do we, keep them, you know, the problems we have are trying to get them to rank. Some of the points with blogs and with that kind of content is, one is be consistent, draw your audience in on a schedule as much as possible. Use quality over quantity, which we'll talk about in a second. Write to one person. Again, this is something Seth Godin talks about. He, he optimizes to one person, but if, if you're helping that person fix a problem, it can help. Make your stuff problem solving. That doesn't mean necessarily only how to, but why are customers coming to us? It's not because they just want to give us money. They, they're trying to fix and solve a problem. Authenticity, which is a buzzword that uh, I hate using as well, uh, that's come up so often, but it, it's perfectly fine here. Um, and consider who the author is that's writing it. So one of the ways to keep, get your blogs to optimize higher, and you can apply this to video, you can apply it to a lot of different things, but go to a key, keyword ranker, Simra, Shahrefs, any of those. Type in what your competitors are doing. Look for what ranks high for them. Look for a low search but high cost per click, which is money to me. Uh, go to Google and search for that just to see what, you're, what else you're doing. Start looking at what falls on page one of Google, which is generally you know the one through 10 after the ads. And then also look at 11 through 20. Look at second page. Don't just look at um, your first page to see what the winners are doing. Go look at page two to see what the losers are doing because that's where you know anything after page one is where we joke that it's where it goes to die. Solve a problem and rewrite uh, your blog posts. One of the things I tell people is write a much better article. There's a lot of people out there who are, who are talking about this as well. Take the blog that the other people are writing, poke holes in their theory, show what your brand can do that's different, make that your differentiator if you know what your story is, and write an amazing content piece. Then you need to get people to engage it, share it, and they need to do that within the first few hours of when you put it out there to help that algorithm rank higher. Get publishers and influencers, anybody that normally shares your content. You're not gonna do this with every piece, but when you get one that's just a really stellar piece, this is when you really want to go nuts and push it. Get your employees to amplify content. Not enough people take advantage of, of uh, employee engagement, mainly because a lot of employees are just simply not engaged today. Stop writing articles that suck. That's one of my biggest things is there's so much crappy content out there right now that needs to stop. And that's one of the reasons that people don't go read because if you give them a lot of junk content, they're not going to go read your one good piece. So one is also, I don't know if you're familiar with this, concept, but concept clusters. This is something that uh, different people theorize on ways to, to get 
bigger pieces of content to rank. So if you know you've got a problem, uh, and again, apologize for some of the artwork, pick a topic overarching theme. There's really kind of two options I've come up with. Look at the keywords to find your clusters. Find out which piece either is part of the theme and then write a better content piece, or find out which, are, which of your current pieces ranks the highest, and then cr that's your pillar. Take, take a pillar page. Then you want to start adding other types of content that push traffic towards that. And you add links in between. That's where you optimize. You test and then you optimize again and again and again. Content pieces cannot be stale. If you get them ranked at the top, they will start falling slowly and surely. But you can build other pieces to support that. If you have an overarching theme, you can build a lot of your messaging that points back to your stellar piece. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't strategize that way and then they just have random pieces of too much content. Uh, you know, a lot of people use the Northern Star and I'm gonna go back to this. This is for any types of content, repurpose it. If you're doing audio or video, make sure you transcribe it. We talked a little bit about that. Rev.com, he mentioned, um, but also look at Timmy. Timmy is owned by Rev. If you don't have a big budget and you have some ample free time, Rev typically transcribes. It's, it's, I think they use their machine learning to do it, which is Timmy. Timmy is 10 cents a minute. It gets it 80-ish percent right. Rev gets it 100% right. And Rev is, uh, I think they, I'm guessing they probably have their machine learning transcribe it and then a human fixes it. But, uh, but they're owned by the same company and you can take advantage of, of both. Uh, take those and create them as much as you can into audiograms, blog posts, something visual. Integrate that content into your stories and ads. If you, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but pulling the whole piece together with, with content, including in your ads, is, is working really well. And I'll go into a little more detail shortly. Share it as micro content. Have influencers we talked about. I mean, my, my background's mostly digital. It's not mostly influencer, but it's something I use, especially now to, to aug augment content significantly. Again, have employees share it and then share it multiple times during the year. Email marketing, just some interesting email marketing stats. There are a thousand different studies out there, so none of these are gonna be perfectly. I, I was looking through a, over the last couple of years a lot of different marketing charts, and I would say in general, it, people are receiving right now between 120 to 140 a day, in, which is scary when you think about the office environment and how much other stuff you have to go on. That's so what I was talking about yesterday in our panel, we talked about trying to learn things. You don't have time because you're reading emails and putting out fires all day. Um, but most of it is consumed on mobile. And you know we don't talk about in, in conferences as much about mobile marketing, but it's still important. I think everybody's sort of figured out that's where we're consuming a ton of our content. But if you wonder why your uh, emails aren't getting read, another is part of content shock, and it's some of it's when your content's not great and so on. But I've worked with a lot of firms that drive me crazy that have sent me frames, wireframes for, our, and, and good brands that, that know and do this stuff. People are still designing emails with a desktop or laptop, and, it, and I don't know why, because we're consuming a great majority, two-thirds or better, of emails using a thumb. So you've got to really take that into your strategy. There are tons of case studies I can show you where people are watching the time we spend with scrolling down with your thumb. It's a very interesting science. I will tell you the most important thing you can do other than spam really is build your first party list. This is a data strategy. It's, it's a data strategy that also goes with Facebook, with building your private groups and things like that. But your first party email lists are as gold as you're ever gonna get in marketing. That is your audience. Consider those people like a publisher. Be a publishing house. Think of how you're marketing to them just like you are marketing a movie and trying to get everybody to come in for admission. A perfect analogy, but you know what I mean. Podcasts, another thing that I focus a lot on. According to one estimate, there are over 660,000 podcast shows. There are over 28 million episodes. 45% of those, interestingly enough, 
have a $75,000 uh, or better a year income, which is considered high unless you live in downtown Chicago. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of consulting advice I give now on podcasts because of my own and having worked with this over the years and having had a background in TV and radio. It is a wonderful um, thing that I've even found myself getting lazy on and that is not spending enough time looking at, at voice SEO, which applies to this as well. When he also talked about uh, yesterday about transcribing, I, I don't spend enough time transcribing because I haven't been able to have the time with my normal day job and conferences and things like that. But I'm about to interview a fairly good sized, well-known name who was a star on American Idol who is deaf and hearing impaired. It reminded me so much that the stuff that I'm preaching about, I haven't done enough transcriptions for because you've got still a, a decent size of the population that can't take advantage of sitting in their car, which we get spoiled by listening to podcasts. Brands need to do more of this as well and transcribing these so that somebody can read them. Uh, it is important to take any of your audio content, but especially a podcast because so many brands are dipping their toes in this right now and make it voice SEO helpful to your customer. The market's exploding with this though. I can tell you the number of, of requests I get daily has uh, probably grown by 10 on sponsorships for the show. I currently don't, don't do any sponsorships, but I work with, I consult with a lot of people that are entering in this space currently and, and brands are pouring money into it because it's they know that they can hit a really niche audience. I mean, if you know that somebody, for example, is in that 75 grand range and that's your target audience, uh, again, that's, you know, to your question yesterday about um, influence, podcasts for B2B are a wonderful way to cultivate an audience and, and build them. So look for those kind of people that are doing it in that space. But it just shows you the explosion and growth in, in podcasting. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to accidentally drop this. We'll talk about this wonderful podcast later, though. So that's the name of mine. Another thing, so we're going to talk a little bit about video and YouTube, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on where video is exploding in Facebook. We all know that it consumes better, but I, I just think it's interesting that, <coughs> pardon me, April 1st of 2005, first YouTube video, it's just like blogs and it's just like podcasts. There's so much content to create. We know video works well, but how do you get it to rank better when there's so much that's being pushed out there that's not, uh, it's just a flood of content. It's content shock. Social media, again, how many channels, you know, I used, I used to tell everybody, and this is a fake hashtag, so hashtag, fake, fake hashtag, but I, I tell people a lot to be where your customers are, but it's interesting, I doubt there's anybody in here that has somebody that's dedicated to Snapchat only at their brand. Even with 186 million users, you might have a social media manager, but it's pretty hard to take and have somebody for WeChat dedicated to it. It's got over, you know, a billion users worldwide. I mean, it's an insane amount of, of, of people to put out there. But when you look at all these channels, you know, you can only do so much with so many funds. Generally speaking, and this is also because people flood crappy content. This is an average I've seen across a lot of, people, a lot of places that only half of a 1% are sharing your content. It's again why I went back to employee engagement and trying to get people that are invested in your brand and cultivating those fans that you have on your social channels. I worked for a lawn care brand. They had 400,000 followers. There were a lot of people on there that were not fans because they didn't take advantage of it. And there were, they had 10,000 employees. That employee engagement to me was always missing because if I see something with 500 likes on a social post, you know, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of people will like it. If you haven't gotten people engaged to do that, they won't. And that's why we're at the percentage we're on. The future is private, I think-ish. I used to work closely with Facebook as well in the past. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I, I feel like they're moving in that, but I also tell you if you have not taken advantage of setting up a private group within your Facebook, you should really consider doing it because that's a hot trend, just like email marketing on your, on your first party data. Set up as many uh, of those private groups as you can and really cultivate those. You know, the pixel they talked about, this has been in the news. They didn't remove the pixel, but they've given people the option to cleanse a lot of their 
stuff. I don't, I don't know how many of you are, most of you familiar with this? Sort of? Okay, so this, this is part of how he came in the news and said the future is private is they wanted to give people the option to, you know, you can put a pixel on a page and track and then retarget and share, they shared a lot of data with a lot of companies, including Axiom that I used to work with. But they didn't actually remove the pixel, they gave you an option to, I kind of equate it to uh, just like when you um, sign an agreement with a credit card, it's on page 400 of the little agreement in tiny top type, but you can go in there as a user now and remove, remove that part of the data and um, cleanse your own personal what you share with, with them and with their third party users. So take advantage of that if you can. But that's why I say if you're building a first party data list, or a first party group, a private group that gives you the opportunity to have a more intimate conversation, which is them instead of sharing their data across the board. I think most people know about one of the one of the tactics I do with everybody is always get them to look at where other ads. I'm not a big fan of copying or mimicking what everybody else is doing in your space, but I'm always a big fan of going to look just for research purposes of anything to see what other ads people are running. And part of the privacy shift that Facebook made some time ago was allowing that you, if you're gonna run an ad on Facebook, you know that you have to leave it open to where anybody can go look at it. So you could go look at your competitors. There's a button up there that's about as unclearly marked in this graphic as could be, but it says info and ads. And you can go look and at, see what any business's ads are running and see where their performance is. So you can go look if this one was a, a market uh, I think this is the one from their website, but if you want to, if you run a market and want to see what other mark, what other markets are doing, you can go look and see what ads are performing. And then if you have something of similar nature, if you're in that space, at least you can go figure out what works for them, you know, or works for what might work for you. Uh, influencer marketing work. So, I mean, again, we had a, a great time talking to Kylie. You'll, you'll see the second lady, she's coming up here shortly this afternoon. But again, I'll, I'll skip most of the stuff I talked about yesterday, but I'm a huge proponent now of influencers when they're managed correctly, when you build that space out. Again, the whole point of this is just humanizing your brand, helping you connect with people because brand babble doesn't you know, particularly work for me. I'm assuming it doesn't work for you. But if you wanna know how to better connect your uh, brand to a human, it's gonna be through a human, not through AI and machine learning only. Uh, reputation management. So pardon the, the Taylor Swift reference that we were talking about this morning, uh, but she had a, an album called Reputation. He, he brought up Sprinkler yesterday. If you're not familiar with these, and I've, I've worked and, and dealt with these guys a lot, the Sprinkler, Hootsuite, Sprout, Spreadfast, I think Sprout's based here for some reason, or maybe it's Spreadfast, I can't remember. But um, when you're looking at your reputation, which is kind of an offshoot, if you will, of influencer marketing in some way. You talk about who you listen to in your neighborhood. I will tell you that, one, yes, you should be listening. I'm also a proponent of looking at it from an enterprise level with tying it into your reputation. Uh, I helped pull uh, reputation.com, built one of their first enterprise-wise social listening and reputation monitoring platforms stay together because just like our last speaker Tim talked about, all of the technology needs to be pulled together. If you have a, a platform like Sprout, which is a really good product, and you have a, a product like BirdEye, which again is another really good product, if those are two disparate systems, especially reputation management and where people are talking about you and your brand, that needs to talk together as much as possible. You've got to look at all the connectivity points and this is one of the best examples to where you're pulling data in. Uh, you've got to see all the pieces that go into it to form one picture of where your customers are talking. So at least consider when, whenever you're considering either a social listening tool or a reputation management tool, make certain that you can get as much of it as you can out of pulling the entire story together so that marketing and customer service work more closely together. Employee engagement, uh, again, it's important. I, I can't tell you enough how underutilized it is. If you are with a big company uh, and you have a significant number of employees, most companies, the employee engagement stats are down the toilet. They just aren't engaged. And that's not necessarily a marketing 
problem, it's more of a marketing opportunity is if the company can help turn it around, it can make a significant difference in your social media presence. Who is the hero? I often spend time talking about who is the focus of this because it's a, a constant thing that comes up in marketing. A lot of people, including me in the past, used to always talk about your customer is the hero. I've shifted a lot of my own personal opinions of that because customers come to you. The customers are the focus of it. But your customers com are coming to us today and how the journey has changed for you to fix a problem. They're not coming to just go like everything you've got on social. We can't get arrogant enough as, as marketers, especially digital marketers, to think that what we're saying is a blessing to them. They're coming to us to help fix a problem, whatever that problem is, not so that we can anoint them with some brilliant speech. So be the hero for them and help them fix a problem in that part of the journey. And again, this was a wonderful movie. I don't know why I just didn't show this up. If you haven't, has anybody not seen it? And did they know that Thor died? I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Thor didn't die. But it's a lot better than uh, what the NFL player said on his Twitter feed. Um, but it did make me cry, I'll just tell you this. So paid media, don't optimize traffic, optimize traffic that converts. This again, where I spend a big chunk of my focus on in lead gen. Most of the problem that a lot of people are doing is they're looking at that optimizing again the same the wrong way with with clicks, but you've got to track track leads, not clicks, and that's where you optimize. I personally don't care if a lead costs me five dollars or five hundred dollars. If I can optimize it to where I can more efficiently get a more efficient cost per sale than a cost per lead, it always is better for me in the end run. And unfortunately, we've been spoiled with some of the data to focus too much on clicks. So again, this is just my personal opinion. Um, in general though, that all channels should teach us is not to put too much eggs in one basket. I think I talked a lot about Google and in, in a lot of conversations I have daily and I talk about Facebook as well, but I think Facebook with all the things that have happened is probably a, a more indicative example. Uh, Facebook's really where it teaches us that we can't put all of our money into one basket if we're wanting to do something in social. It does the same way with putting all your money in Google. I used to uh, get a higher conversion rate with a really large significant amount of change. I used to get a higher conversion rate on Bing and Yahoo, which was 10% of my spend at best, but I would have flooded 20% if I could easily on a large budget just to get it. But that just shows you, you can't pour everything into Google as wonderful as they are or evil as are, whichever your point is. Context for, for ads uh, is something that's coming up so often too as well. It comes up with, with biology that I mentioned yesterday, but when you're looking at doing your, your ads, don't waste your spin. I look at it just like with linear TV is the same. Don't put it out there if it's not contextual. Your lifts from a behavioral science point of view, which is where this comes from, with priming especially uh, towards the bottom, has a you'll get a much higher click ratio if you can target wh where that's coming from. The journey, so again, another thing that, I, that we focus on where I work, because we have a, an attribution technology, is looking at the touches to convert by industry. Never read all the normal Google stuff that tells you you should be getting, it's not, again, not a, a slap at Google, but you shouldn't be focused too heavily on what the averages are. It always should be what your industry or vertical is. I've worked across a lot of brands where it was either one week or it was a year. I mean, the, the, when you start looking at, at this as an example, education has a much longer tail, um, you know, than, than a lot of things like retail, where you go in and the next day you're buying something, if it's a makeup brush that costs $2, Maybe you saw an ad on, on Google and the next day you go get it or order it on Amazon. Education's a six month process to begin and that's before you see a lot of other noise that goes into content. This is just the advertising journey. Same thing as days to convert. You gotta think about how long it takes and that was just another example of how long it takes for somebody to convert as part of that journey. This is the example that I really like to focus on and this comes from 
just one of our dashboards where we were focused and why, why I talk about UTM tagging and he brought it up yesterday being so important. This is a real world example from one of our clients who will remain nameless where they first saw an ad on Google. They saw an ad on connected TV device, which is really exciting. Then they saw something, another ad on Bing. They went to Facebook. They went to LinkedIn and saw another ad. They saw something that was served up from the trade desk through their data. Then they converted on Google. Then they showed, uh, they saw one more ad on Bing. That's where we stopped tracking it at the end of that, this particular one for this screenshot. If you went to last click, which is a dirty word, last click would typically tell you that Google was the only thing that influenced this, but it shows you that they had a lot of different touch points along the way. And that doesn't even include all the other stuff you might be sending them. I had another example that I can get in time for, for screen sharing. If you have your email campaigns that go out, that needs to be tagged. If, if you have the right kind of device set up and you're looking at this, you can't just only, only look at the first point or the last point of entry. Let data remove the bias, and that's part of what I, just, what I was just talking about. You've got to optimize on what's converting, not just on what you think and what you've gone with for 10 years is your 1995 offer that always works. Unfortunately, that's where too many of us get built in, and we see, you know, I traditionally go with 1995, another just example, but it shows that it's a, indicatively a problem. So I'd like everybody to think about picking up this magazine because I talked about, it's like a $20 magazine, but it, some, of their, some of their reads get boring, but I've had a lot of conversations with people lately about what's going on in China. I've been following this for a while, but China's doing a really good job. I say China. Well, there's a lot of companies in China that are leading this right now with integrating a lot more of their advertising and marketing and storytelling concepts together. So you build your storytelling journey and you integrate that throughout the ads and a lot of people don't plan out and do that. They look at it as here's one channel, here's another channel, here's another channel. But where customers are going to see you the most often just because you're putting stuff out on Google for example is not or organic search only uh, but it's going to be a lot of those paid advertising spots and that's why Google makes a lot of money. You can integrate that into your storytelling. So I, I encourage people to give this a read. I just think it's a, a really good read to look at at how they're weaving together the entire journey, which is again, going back to the ORM conversation, start looking at all the points and like what Tim brought up yesterday. I think one of the things, especially in marketing that we've got to focus on more are the direct marketing tactics that work. I have worked with some, some guys, there are several companies that do this, I call it pixel to postcard. Start taking the, the conversations that your customers are having with you on a website and just revert back to old direct mail type stuff where direct mail works. I worked for a brand that sent out 100, pieces, 100 million pieces of mail a year and it did convert extremely well. Nobody gets much direct mail anymore. But you can also weave that together with setting a pixel on, on a page and working with some of these companies. I'm happy to refer them later. Uh, put a pixel on there. Within 24 hours, they can look at, based on IP address and information like that, and then reconcile that. They can send a personalized postcard to somebody. I mean, that's a great way to follow up with somebody other than just a simple retargeting ad, and it's a lot more timely. And again, it's a little creepy, but it's less creepy than you accidentally clicked on something, which freaks me out. And, you know, I'm haunted by this, this ad that follows me for the next 48 hours. Optimization is one of my, um, one of the things that upsets me the most that people don't take time on. There are very few companies that spend time, enough time, in my opinion, optimizing. If you have somebody coming to a landing page, anywhere, if it's off-site, if it's a separate domain, but if you're not optimizing uh, that page constantly, whether you're using heat maps, uh, Google Analytics, whatever, there's a ton of different, different companies out there, Crazy Egg, Kissmetrics, all, all of them there that can tell you different points to look at. You've got traffic that, come that, that comes to your site, when, when you, but we're all geared towards pushing more traffic, pushing more traffic, pushing more traffic. The conversion rate is where your money is on your pages. Because if they've come there and they've fallen off, and, a lot, and unfortunately, most companies spend more money on social media optimization and those 
the, that channel alone than they'll ever spend on increasing. How many of you have a dedicated CRO person within your company? Just a few hands. But there, I guarantee if I ask the same question about social media, you know, every, I mean, a good 50% or better are going to have a social media person. That doesn't make it better than the other. But if you're spending more money and driving more traffic to these pages and you need sales, you've got to figure out the best ways to optimize it. And I won't disagree too much. There was somebody, I'll just tell you my experience. Somebody asked yesterday about using video on um, pages. Uh, let the data drive it. Videos are great, but people like me who, who have short-term disorders with, with attention spans, uh, you, it's like saying squirrel, and then I jump out the window. I would, I'm not a proponent of putting video on the first page because if you give them any reason to jump before they convert, you have to be careful of that. Now, that's also look at, you know, run A-B tests on the two and look and run A-B tests constantly and run A-B tests that look at one or two things. A lot of people get in the habit of putting... I've made one chain here. I've got one page here, and then I've got seven pages. Seven, sorry, I've got one page here, and then I've got another page that I've made with seven changes on it. And then I want to A/B test it and that and think to see which one works. I've worked enough. Kim and I worked in statistical analysis enough to know that when you have that many um, determinant variables, it will alter your results. So you've got to focus a more narrowed test and then keep optimizing on top of it. You have to be careful with video so that video doesn't give them the opportunity to jump. But one of the things that I am a huge proponent of is putting video on a landing page, uh, not necessarily Ariana Huff, Ariana Grande, I almost said Huffington, but she wrote a song uh, called Thank You. So I'm a big proponent on it for two reasons. Mainly, it does give you a very soft opportunity to upsell if you want to, but I'm not a big fan of that. Because you don't want to confuse them from the sale if they haven't already converted on your e-commerce site. But it's also an opportunity to really get them engaged more in your brand. I did this when working with St. Jude Hospital, which I think is the greatest brand in the world. They, we did some stuff that, that was very important to me, and we produced a video where we... Uh, it was it was something I had scheduled a couple of years ago where we I wanted I live in Memphis and that's where St Jude Hospital is, and they have a, you know kids don't pay for anything the parents don't pay for anything, and we did a thing after I had come back from one of my thousand trips to New York I saw somebody doing more character art and I wanted to bring a character artist to to their target house where the kids and fa where the families often stay uh, free. And I wanted them to be able to have somebody describe their, their best times outside. That was part of our, our branding uh, when I was working at True Green, was live life outside. So we brought them out there. We had several character artists. The kids loved it. And they, all they saw were the smiles on their faces. And I really want to stop that gif, though. It's driving me crazy. Um, we took that, though, and we used it on social. We used it on all of our channels. But we also put it on the landing page. Now you encourage somebody to buy a lawn care, which is not necessarily the, a fun product, if you will, when you're trying to you know, kill weeds, but you, you invest them into a cause like St. Jude, which is known worldwide in what you're doing, and you show your brand associated with helping people. That's very obviously popular right now. It had a significant lift, and because that can convert very easy as well. When it gets to your sales department, if they watch through it, it was our highest converting on on social as well. But it also, you know, it doesn't have to be St. Jude. Um, it can be just showing profiles of your employees with video. It's a wonderful opportunity to give a, a softer side of Sears, if you will. Sorry, Sears. Attribution. So John Wanamaker is one of my favorite quotes that uh, nobody's heard of, but half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. This guy was considered a pioneer in marketing in the late 1800s. He uh, would be considered an out-of-work CMO today because if you're able to, if you don't know where, where half your money's going, you're not going to live very long in this world. So a key focus today 
is spending as much time as you can on figuring out what's working and what's not. Talking about modeling, um, again, pardon the, the graphics, but most people look at the second one at last click. There are a ton of different ways to model out attribution based on a lot of different variables, but I am just, you know, there's a bunch that I didn't even list. Those are the top five, but um, modeling should not be last click because if they're only converting on Google, which is great, that's gonna be a chunk of your traffic, that doesn't mean you're gonna ignore every other channel where your customers live or where they're doing research on you and so forth. So just keep that in mind. Measurement, what are we measuring? In today's digital world, it's still, and you heard this phrase mentioned yesterday, Vanity Graphics, again, this is Tom, the brilliant Tom Fishburne, who talks about all the ridiculous stuff that we measure that doesn't convert, that doesn't convert to a sale, it doesn't convert to true engagement on your brands. It's when you look at an influencer and wonder how many followers do they have only? Okay, that doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it's the engagement that an influencer has within their channel. You know, Kylie has a high engagement rate that we talked to yesterday. She's got 130,000 followers. There are other people that I know that have twice what she has that I follow and I've worked with over my career that don't have hardly any engagement. I, I often question, what is that worth? But it's another, you know, simplified indication of, of the types of things that we spend too much time looking at today. MarTech, I wanted to be the first one to show this graph, but Tim beat me to it two weeks ago. I showed it first, but again, this is from Scott Brinker, uh, who I've had on my podcast as well. He is, um, this is one of the biggest challenges that CMOs have today. I will say this when looking at, at marketing technology, make sure to figure out as many ways today to connect all your pieces. Don't look at it as a task-friendly tech spin when you get it, figure out a way to pull all the pieces together uh, with your customer data so that they're all taught benefiting the customer, not just your individual department or things like that. I'm going to skip AI mach machine learning to a larger degree because I work for a company that has machine learning. I like it for optimizing bias. I'm not a big fan of chatbots personally. Chatbots uh, should, in my opinion, just for where most of us are using AI and machine learning. There's the theoretical stuff of all the things that happen. I'm not necessarily worried about Skynet today, but I will tell you two things on AI and machine learning for, for quick sake. Bots should help you get to where you need to go. If they're not helping your customers get there, they're useless. I don't, I find so often, and I've got I, that sites of groups and teams that I've worked with have bots to have bots, but they don't help the customer get to where they need to go. You collect a lot of data and a lot of frustrating conversations. Look at how many bounces you have. The other, and I had this conversation with somebody. This comes from a really good description that I'll, I'll butcher a little bit from Chris Penn, uh, the, the, the marketing influencer, MarTech influencer. He talks about where we're all worried about what machines and the AI will do with our jobs. Really make your job, if you will, think about it this way. If you're, if you can take uh, repetitive tasks and automate them, then great. Your safety, if you will, and job security as a marketer is going to be how complex your job is. The more creative and more unique and complex your job is, is the way to to not have to worry as much today about AI as you, as you might be paranoid about. The thing that's really important, and I'm going to skip through some of these slides, go pretty quickly on this, but TV and video comes up a lot. I think I mentioned that I was at a I spoke at a TV conference last week. TV is gonna go through some radical changes that are gonna affect digital marketers. We are gonna converge. You're not gonna have a TV buyer and a digital uh, video buyer much longer. That is gonna converge. This is where we're spending a lot more time today is on digital. Digital includes in this one and what most of them, I mentioned yesterday, your things like Hulu and Netflix fall into the digital space but that's still TV. So doesn't necessarily apply to ads, but we're, we're starting to, to see, just like I showed on the, the dashboard view earlier, we're starting to see a lot more connected TV devices where you're able to serve ads because I had a, a pretty big footprint in it addressable on advanced TV. First ad was shown in 1941. And show, it was a nine second ad that ran for, I think, $4. It was Bulova. Had a map of the US, had Bulova on the clock, and it said, brought to you by Bulova Time or something like that. It was like worth $150,000 in, in 
in uh, U.S. dollars today. But this is where TV spend is going and where digital video to OTT is connecting. 5G, 5G is really going to affect a lot of that. Here's another quick graphic. This is where we're talking about. You'll get this deck later. we got about five minutes left, so I'm having to rush through some of this stuff. Your video consumption, which is dominating the space right now, these are the channels where a lot of that's being served. And that doesn't even include all the TV places. Biggest focus where Kim and I work together in the past at Axiom is, is data enabling your, your, your TV spend. But the game changer is 5G. And that was a big conversation point. I'm a big believer that 5G will dramatically impact what we're doing in our roles because so much of that will be converged into more advanced and connected TV. I mean, DISH and DirecTV, the rumor mills going around that they're going to merge. Uh, a lot of changes are going to come with what you're doing in satellite, cable, and, and TV. And that's going to fall heavily on digital marketing because that's where the pendulum is swinging. I'm going to skip some of the turf war stuff, but that's basically what I'm talking about. Data, the challenges that we have in data really come from GDPR. That birthed um, just over a year ago. They just had their birthday last month. I don't know if you got GDPR cards, but I'll be happy to send you one. But if you think about the amount of data that we're consuming today, it's enormous of how much data and data cleansing affects us. You're basically, we're producing almost four, uh, if you consider one gig a brick, like a Netflix movie, you're talking about a gig a brick, we're consuming as a, as a world about four, um, four Great Walls of China a day. That's going to grow to from 33 zettabytes to 175 zettabytes. It's an insane amount of data because of 5G also that you're going to be able to consume. Cleanliness of data, this is such a big, big problem. I get, Hey, how many clients I work with that have disparate data systems where even the IT department's managing them, but they sit where one group's got some data for email, one group's got some data for some other loyalty program, one other group's got another one, and they're not connected. You've got to clean your data, whether you, but make certain that you invest the time to know what a CDP does and what a CDP does not. Audience targeting, I'm going to skip. Publisher, we're going to skip. Voice. I'm a big proponent, again, of what you can do with voice, but not just in audio. I'll also tell you that if you're not using a call intelligence software like I talked about, look at it if you're getting a significant number of calls. It's not the cheapest technology, but it does some amazing things. Cause, I talked a little bit about St. Jude. Find a cause that matters you can associate your brand with. This is a picture we took there. Uh, you know, It will humanize your brand in a lot of ways, not just St. Jude. It's just like doing that with, with the coats for kids. It's how consumers respond to purpose-led companies. Especially, it will elevate your digital footprint tremendously. Teams, one of the biggest problems nobody talks about at most conferences, you guys probably know this if you've hired anybody, it's hard as hell to hire a good digital marketer today. It is one of the reasons I talk about being complex and being well-versed. If you're looking for a data scientist, good luck, because IBM is trying to consume all of them. One of my biggest complaints right now is silos, though. It is all the pieces that need to connect together. Your customers don't exist in silos. Do not allow your marketing and advertising efforts to do that, please, because your customer, eventually, we're trying to do an omni-channel message to where we give them a more refined message. But I talked about this on my most recent podcast, is that we, uh, as customers, we're not wasting time as consumers. We're not wasting time looking at your brand with the many layers. They, you may think they see all of these different things that are created. This is just a, a graphic representation of all the teams and departments you work with, third party teams working on something to build out something for you, but they only see you as this, as one brand. You've got to keep that in mind because there are too many other options. You may work for the greatest company in the world where you are, but there are competitors out there who are trying to compete for their time. You've got to create the differentiator and then overemphasize that message. I always talk about Google trend data, I think is, is horrible. It, it, it's not, don't look at Google trend data necessarily to help you learn. Go to as many conferences like this. And I was writing this out the other day, talking about how to make digital marketers get better. And I started listing so much crap that we have to deal with. And it kept going and going. And I think I stopped because I was spacing, but there's so much that's part of our job that is insane as how quickly it's grown, but you've got to be good in all of these now today, not just one only. 
The most important thing I will tell you though is that we are as marketers trying to solve problems for customers. The journey has changed. That's why they're coming to you looking for something. Unfortunately, they're actually a lot more complex problems than just the one on the far left. But we look at customers too much like this to where we're trying to upsell them yellow and red and that's the problem. So my recommendation to you is to focus on building trust, build out your differentiator, focus more on user experience than title tags, replace Google with customer, Foc hyper focus as much as you can on your customer, obsess, create that digital customer experience for them that will make or break your brand. This is a, a joke picture that I took. This is a real world candid photography. Instead of just putting a picture of your family or kids or whatever at your cubicle, take one customer, get to know them, put them in a $4 frame, I'll pay you back for it at Walmart, and or $5.97, put that on your desk and focus on that customer. I don't mean to sound creepy, but you have to take that point of view now because that's who's coming to you to help fix their problems. Get to know your customers well and create a digital experience that will change why the, how and why they look at your brand. So I do a podcast that this young lady I'm about to introduce has been on, uh, but it's got a lot of the leading influencers that have been on. I'm a proponent of it. It's, it's not selling ads or anything right now. These are all major influencers in the space. If you'd like to find me, unless you're trying to sell me something, I'll pretty much always accept something on LinkedIn. Um, but uh, I, spend, I try to spend, I'm gonna start posting more diving pictures this summer. And thank you very much. Anybody have any questions before we get out of here? Yes, ma'am. He's, uh, I've got the box. And I'll be quick. You hit on it briefly, but in two separate categories, influencers and then employee engagement. Uh -huh. But can employees be influencers? Absolutely. Now, it depends on what, you, and it also depends, your employees are your best influencers by far. Do you have an influencer who is an employee that has 100,000 followers? You have to be very careful about that, and there has to be some guidance. I mean, one, you've got to have your social media strategy written out and confirmed by your legal and PR team. But you also have to be careful, and this is something I've, I've had a lot of conversations with lately. If you have an influencer with 100,000 people and you fire that employee, it can be a massive problem because they can have a huge impact well beyond just at one glass door uh, review. So, but look at your mass employees as an opportunity to get 10,000, if you have 10,000 employees or 1,000, as an opportunity to get them engaged. That really focuses back on being a better brand or product or service than it does anything. And then your employees, you know, if, you're, if you have a bad brand, your employees are gonna get beat down. It just happens. But the more engagement you have, it, it can create a mass appeal. Uh, but they are your best influencer personally. It's the best way for you to quickly humanize a brand. Even with an influencer, you have to, for lack of a better air quote, sell them on who you are and what you do and things like that. Your employees should be invested in it, but unfortunately, employee engagement has just really fallen off a cliff. But it's a double-edged sword with, with, uh, with how, many, how often, especially in our field, how often things change with marketing advertising. Um, you talked a little bit about um, creating private groups with Facebook and yeah. email. Can you go into a little bit of detail on that? I can't. Can we talk after? Because I'm he's giving me an evil eye back there. And this is the problem with, with covering up a trend like this. There's about, just like the Einstein pictures, there's a thousand things to cover in our field. It's kind of hard to do all that in like 55 minutes. So anyway, thank you for your time, especially yesterday with me as well. And now we'll go to the next speech. So uh, I would thank you. <laughs>